Hola. Sí. Perfecto. Um, so yes, thank you very much for the kind invitation. Uh, it's really a pleasure to be here in Barcelona with you. Well, out of many reasons, actually my most favorite city on earth. So it's it's great to be here, and um, it's a pleasure to to share with you my passion for lighting, and to take you today on a little let's say on a little journey of light, uh, showing you a couple of projects our office has been doing over the last years, okay? So, um, myself, I'm a director um, at the German Lighting Consultancy, well, actually with an incredibly difficult name, as Birgit said, Lichtkunstlicht, which means, uh, translated it would mean light art light. And um, we are based in two cities in Germany. One is in Bonn and the other one is in Berlin. And we work on uh, many international and national projects, quite wide, wide range. So we do many museums. We do office buildings, governmental buildings, um, many master plan projects. And uh, besides the artificial lighting, we are really engaged into the use of um, the natural light source the daylight and the sun to make the most of it. So when I say we, we are a group of 26 people, 26 lighting designers, and we have a quite of a wild, nice uh, mixed background. So many of us are uh, architects or interior designers, but then there are people from the theater lighting design, there are product designers for the custom-made products, then there are electrical engineers, and we all work close together. So why did I choose this title of, for today? It's austere, austere Lighting Timeless Design. It's actually, I mean, it actually reflects very well the way we work in the office. Um, we think that less is more. We really try, um, well, in, when we work in architectural lighting projects, we try that the luminaire, the, the lighting object itself, is not in the focus of design, but rather the lighting effect, the lighting appearance it's generated is important. So for us, lighting is really the integrated part of architecture, as uh, our famous pioneer Richard Kelly said once. Or let's take this grumpy guy on the left side. He's Adolf Loos. Is this super famous, or he was a super famous Austrian architect, and he wrote in the essay called Ornament and Crime, you might know it, how he really refuses any decoration and any ornamentation in architecture. And in a very similar way, we as an office see that. We don't see lighting design as a decoration. We think that it should support the architecture. And um, well, in, at the end, I mean, lighting is a very powerful tool. You, you create the hierarchy in the space. You, you decide with the lighting what's visible and what's invisible. So therefore, we should, sh you know, we should be very careful with it. And um, the best would be that you come into a space and the lighting is almost natural for us. It's almost um, yeah, self-evident. And also, just before I show you a couple of projects, I mean, when we start a project, we usually try to create a story, literally a story, uh, like a poetic approach, because we feel that um, with the story behind a lighting project, um, the architect and also the client really is able to identify more with the result. So now I'm going to show you a couple of our projects, just a few of them, and uh, tell you a few stories. The first one is a museum. It's a museum in Münster, which is in the north of Germany. And um, the museum project, I'm going to show it's actually extension building to an existing museum. It's in the heart of that city, just right next to the cathedral, as you can see on the left side. Um, for the exterior lighting, we actually had this uh, approach to have lighting from the inside to the outside. The only lighting we have here is the lighting installation you see on the left side. It's a lighting installation done by Otto Pine. And all we did here was actually just changing the light source from halogen to LED. 
And um, well, unfortunately, Otto Pina, he didn't see the result as he just passed away two months before the opening, as you guys might know, uh, it was two years ago. So that's actually the view you see once you enter the museum. It's the foyer. It's a huge space, um, three story high, and it's spanned by this huge atrium, uh, sorry, this huge skylight. So we have a skylight, uh, glass construction, and below that there's a membrane ceiling. And you have this nice play of light and shadow on that membrane ceiling during the daytime. So the space is filled with light. And all we wanted as a lighting designer not to touch that ceiling. Uh, and therefore, we integrated our lighting into the side walls in the little niches on the left and the right side in order to create a very powerful direct lighting on the floor. And that space, the foyer, is often used as an event space. And therefore, they could or they can change the lighting scenes and change the dimming levels. So for the visitor, in order to get to the exhibition spaces, they take the staircase on the left side. It's a very sculptural staircase. And uh, we emphasize that staircase by a direct lighting coming from above. And we created this linear, long, black lighting slot you might perceive in the ceiling, which brings, again, a very directional, powerful light to the staircase. Now, once you come into one of the exhibition spaces, this could be how an exhibition space is illuminated. It's a very introverted version. It's uh, basically lighting by projectors mounted on a track. But you could do also that. So we gave various options to the curator in the museum. Um, you see that this perimeter ceiling, it's not actually a plasterboard ceiling. It's a backlit stretch ceiling. And what's the novelty? It's actually that we achieved that the walls where the exhibits are are very homogeneously lit. And we used a little trick. Actually, we'll tell you the secrets. What we did was um, we used a, sp uh, a specific spacing of the light strips behind the stretch ceiling. So those light strips behind the stretch ceiling the spacing of them, they, uh, they have were increased towards the, towards the wall. So uh, as close you get to the wall, the greater is the spacing. And therefore, we could really achieve the homogeneous lighting effect. Because otherwise, let me see. Oh, OK. Oh, yeah. Otherwise, you would have a very uh, large hot spot here um, if you would do a channel lighting. And that's uh, exhibition space on the upper floors. It's a day lit exhibition space. So what you see here, it's a huge um, skylight. A skylight, with again, a membrane ceiling below. Lots of daylight is coming in. And um, obviously, for the exhibition space, what was important that we try to avoid any direct sunlight. And um, to do that, we actually inserted a um, micro prismatic louver on the top part of the glass construction, which only allows diffuse daylight coming in from the north part of the sky to enter the space. So there's never any direct sunlight, even though you have diffuse daylight, which is just beautiful. And um, in order to add the artificial lighting, we just followed the same principle as on the, on the, on the floor below. So yeah, to, to keep the consistency in the project. And that would be, again, the image you have at night or yeah, really at night uh, where no daylight is entering the space. Another museum I'm going to show you, and many of you even might know, it's the Städel Museum in Frankfurt. It's, um, it's funny enough that this museum all started with a competition. And um, all of the architects actually choose to, to propose a physical building on that site, a physical building as an extension building to the existing museum. The only architects, Schneid and Schumacher architects, they proposed to actually build that museum underground, below grade and to connect the building, um, the, the museum space, by those circular skylights. And that's, um, that's just amazing. I mean, 
structural wise and static wise this was a nightmare i mean uh, they had lots of problems um but i have to tell you that this is my favorite picture it's just beautiful this bare concrete ceiling with the openings for the future skylight i just think it's uh, it's amazing so obviously for the skylight this is what when we as a light designer came on board in order to define how much amount of daylight and artificial light enters the space. What you see here is a detail section of the skylight. And um, I will explain you a little bit uh, the detailing. So I start from the top. You have here the thermal construction. And then further down, you have here four layers of blinds, which reduce the daylight. There's even a blackout, such so a cut off the daylight. And then where you see the green lines here and there, you have um, the light source, the artificial light source, which, which is an LED. And further down, there's another diffused layer, diffusing layer. The whole thing has been done uh, or tested on a one-to-one -one mock-up in Frankfurt in order to check, does it work? And also to convince the, 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 the clients to, to pay the money for it. Um, on the right side, interesting, here's an arrangement. It shows uh, the positioning of the LEDs. They're actually tunable white LEDs, which means um, that you have two light colors. One is the 3000 Kelvin, which is a warm light, and then there's another one, which is 4000 Kelvin, which is a cool light, uh, very similar to the daylight. Uh, which then has been used in order to add lighting, artificial lighting, in case daylight fades. And then, you know, because we're in an underground space, what was important to us that you really feel the dynamics of daylight, that you look up and you have this uh, link to the, to the outside world, even though you're down in a basement, but we wanted that you don't have the feeling of a basement. So that's the final result. What was interesting that all those skylights are actually digital, meaning that we could address each of them. So let's take, for instance, um, that cabinet here. And let's imagine that we have very light sensitive artwork exhibited there. We could actually reduce the amount of daylight and artificial lighting in there. So each, all of them are like very individually addressable. And that's uh, the view from the outside. Now, we actually are doing quite some traffic and transportation projects in Germany. The latest one is a subway station in Leipzig, done by Max Dudler Architect. And that's the view of it. So imagine yourself you know, taking the escalator, going down to a subway station. What you usually have is a very dark, claustrophobic place and you don't feel very comfortable and uh, safe. This is just the opposite. I mean, this is an underground enclosed space and you have this hall, let's say, filled with airiness and lightness. And um, how, did, uh, how did we do it? I mean, first of all, in terms of architecture, those walls and the ceiling have been constructed by semi-transparent glass bricks. And the, the lighting project actually was pretty easy. So imagine you have the envelope, glass bricks, and then behind that, there's another layer of a concrete wall. So behind that, there's in a certain spacing, a certain distance, a concrete envelope. And all we told them is that they should paint the concrete wall and the ceiling in white. And then we took fluorescent tubes and illuminated that white concrete wall and ceiling. And through the ref reflection of light, we achieved that. That's it. So we have this super uniform diffused illumination and we had to add actually down lights in order to create uh, the sufficient illuminance levels on the platform. And as you see, there's some lighting points in the ceiling. There are, this, there are specific glass bricks which were thinner than the other ones and uh, had higher transparency in order to light through and um, in order to achieve those 300 lux we had to achieve here. But also, I think it's a nice add-on in order to give some sparkle and brilliance on the platform itself. Now, 
many of you might know, um, the former industrial site of uh, the pharmaceutical company Novartis in Basel, it really became, it became a mecca of architecture. I mean, Novartis, they decided to invite many, many top architects to build a laboratory building or an office building on their site. And um, we, we were happy, I mean, we were pretty lucky to work with quite a few of them. But what I wanted to show you today is that building. That's the first building you see once you approach the campus. It's the reception building. This is where you go, you register, you get your badge. And uh, well, it's the first image of Novartis. And it's a very um, open, transparent building with a floating roof. But I mean, this ultimate transparency appears at night where I would say those glazing walls that almost seem to disappear. And you have, as you see, this super indirect uplighting to the roof. So if you ask me where, where are the light sources, I tell you. So the first one is behind the counter, which is here. And the second light source is just parallel to the facade. So they are linear uplights hidden in a technical trough, uplighting towards the ceiling. And the second project I want to show you is a laboratory building designed by the architect Klischenitz, Austrian architect. And here the previewing was to combine two worlds in one. There are the laboratory spaces on the upper floor, which are very technical. And then there are the, um, then there's the space on the ground floor, which they use for many events. And um, this space on the ground floor should be very glamorous and chic. At least this was the pre. So imagine you go inside and you're standing in this ground floor. And then you look up and you have that. So above the, the foyer, you have this huge atrium, which in almost in a double fold sense becomes a light well. It has lots of data coming in. And then we created this yeah, almost sculptural elements uh, for, for the atrium where we uh, made those balustrades light active. They are backlit and therefore, yeah, it's, it almost becomes a sculpture um, and an interface between this technical world up there and what we have down here in, in, in on the foyer. And here another nice story. So those, um, those rooms are conference rooms. And uh, the client asked us to put a chandelier. They really wanted to have a chandelier. And we just refused it because we didn't want to have a chandelier because that does not fit to the architecture. So at some point, we came up with uh, proposing them, um, let's say, a modern approach of a chandelier. And as, as you see on the right side here, what we did, we were actually inspired by yeah, the experiments with the laboratory test tubes. So we took those laboratory test tubes and put them one uh, next to the other and uh, inserted lights. We inserted two different types of lights. There's an omnidirectional light at two heights, which gives the brilliance and the sparkle to the chandelier. And there's another light source, uh, the reflector lamp here and here and here to give a more directional light downward. Well, um, very different project. Sign Iron Works Foundry in a little but beautiful town in Benderf, uh, close to Frankfurt. That building is actually um, also an iron cast facility. It has been constructed in 1830. And then at some point it has been abandoned, neglected, forgotten, and rediscovered just a few years ago as this beautiful iron cathedra cathedral almost. Um, today it's used as an art and cultural space for many exhibitions and, um, and also events. And I have to say that that project has been done by very, very low budget. So the city is very small, and I didn't have money. But still, we really wanted to do that project and to, in order to emphasize that beautiful light architecture and to, yeah, to emphasize the transparency. Mm. 
So if you go inside, there are two main principles. There's one principle to to emphasize the steel structure, and this steel structure, the rough material, has been emphasized by very cool lighting. Cool lighting in terms of light color. And then, um, as you see, the roof itself has been emphasized by a very saturated red-orange color. So I have to say, this project was a hands-on project. It was not, you know, drawing dots and points on the plan. No, it was going there, taking the cherry picker, going up and choosing each and every single um, detailing and mounting position for the luminaries, because that site is um, cultural protected, I mean, like a listed building, and therefore we had to be really careful of where we put the luminaries. Um, as for the ceiling, I mean, I have to say that our philosophy is not to really use colored lighting unless it has a meaning and it makes sense. And this thing, in this case, used the red-orange color as a symbol. Actually, it's a symbol for, you might imagine, I mean, for, for, for the hot iron and for the fire, I mean, for what is, has been there before. And all we wanted that um, if visitors come there, we, we kind of um, bring them the history of the place closer by the colored lighting. And then a nice project, actually here in Spain, it's a hotel. It's Hotel Abadia de Retuerta Le Dumain, in very close to Valladolid. Uh, and actually, just next to Zadon de Duero, who knows that area. And that hotel has been a former monastery. Um, as you see from the air review, it has this typical layout of a monastery. It has as a centerpiece the Iglesia, and then behind that it has the claustro with a little patio. So the, the church itself, it's, it's, it's going to be used nowadays as an event location, or actually many, many weddings take place there. And behind that, there's the claustro where, uh, where uh, all the public spaces are, the restaurants, the meeting rooms, and so on. And then the extension buildings, um, just here and there, they house uh, the extra guest rooms. Then total 33 guest rooms in three suites. And then the client actually decided, no, uh, hang on, we need something else, we need a spa. And decided to build a spa, but underneath. And that's the spa. So the whole project has been finished not even a year ago, and um, it's really a beautiful setting. I mean, it's uh, in between those vineyards and uh, the Rio Duero just passing by. Look, I mean, this would be the view you have once you approach the hotel. And uh, for the exterior lighting, we try to really only illuminate the main road and the main facade, and I have to tell you that it even appears more lighting than it is in reality, because at the end, I mean, this is a very rural area. It's pitch black at night, and all we wanted that the guests to come there and look up, they could see the stars in the sky. Here are some, a few pics of what we had or we saw when we first came on board on, on the project in 2007. It was pretty run down. And the architects, they took care a lot to very sensitively reconstruct the, the whole building into a hotel. In order to achieve that, this is a view of the claustro. Now, in terms of lighting. I told you that we don't use so much lighting objects. We try to integrate lighting into architecture and so on. But there are exceptions. And this is a big one. Because, I mean, this is a listed building. And we had to interfere as little as possible into the existing architecture. Even the electrical wiring, everything, it was like a complete nightmare. So it was very clear to us that if you do lighting, we have to attach something. We have to add on. We have to create surface-mounted luminaries. But then the question is, what's that luminary? I mean, in terms of form and in terms of material. Um, I remember the first we were thinking of glass luminaries. 
at some point we were even thinking of alabaster and then we um, found this perfect match I have to say we, um, we designed luminaries out of massive bronze we worked together with a local manufacturer um, not here but in, in Germany in Bavaria a local bronze manufacturer who helped us producing a family of luminaries for, for the hotel so we designed a family of luminaries just for that site and um, well why did we choose the bronze material first of all I think it has a very warm color to it so it fits perfectly to the stone and then uh, also we found out that wow it's cool we can actually polish the bronze and it becomes golden and then we decided to polish all inner surfaces of all luminaries in order to get this really nice golden lighting for the hotels and also you know that bronze is a material which you can use in a very thick uh, material so those luminaries are made of seven millimeter thick bronze sheets and it was important because otherwise um, those luminaires that just look lost uh, behind or just next to those massive stone walls of the monastery they really had to stand up somehow and um, also as a final reason the bronze material is a material which ages with time and it kind of fits perfectly to a monastery where you yeah you sense you know the history of the last thousand years that's a view in the patio and in the evening because we have the illumination and clouds to create this nice silhouette effect and well I have to say you know when we went there on site it hasn't been a particularly inviting welcoming space I mean it's a cool space it's, it has been a monastery there are very little daylight openings and um, it was very, uh, very clear to us that the lighting has to do the whole job I mean the lighting had to create a nice cozy homey ambience and uh, particularly in that space here which is the refectorio it was really difficult um, we had a few test uh, test trials uh, and failed so the first one was to create a pendant luminaire we thought of a ring luminaire with indirect and direct lighting and we built uh, like a dummy mock-up but then we, we found out that we kind of break the space in two and also the lighting up there didn't feel right for down here and then at the end we came up with a solution which to be honest was not very obvious we put floor lights we actually used the floor lights we had designed for the guest rooms and just made a bigger version of it put reflector lamps inside in order to shoot up the lighting towards the vault roof and also this reflector um, this um, floor light at the end it gives a nice golden glow of light and especially it gives uh, light uh, at a more human level which I think at the end is the secret then you could go into that space which is a wine bar to test all those wines and also dine and um, below that that's the treasure that's the wine cellar and because the hotel is combined uh, with a winery I mean you might know Abadia de Tuerta it's a very good wine by the way um, and actually we were never allowed to enter that space with our security guards it's really interesting <laughs> and for the lighting we also adapted a very simple solution sorry um, we constructed a little arched bracket with the electrical wiring coming from below so we did not touch this at uh, the walls and then on top of that there's a socket with a filament lamp on top that's it and that installation reminds us very much of a, like a simple wall hook with a candle on top which has been actually the original lighting solution in that space and then I told you that the client wanted to create an underground spa and this underground spa had been connected by two patios with the outside world that's one and that's the second one and we deliberately really did not want to eliminate that reflecting pool you see in the center part but we wanted that that space lifts from the reflection of, of the surrounding architecture the vegetation and the lighting 
And then finally, we come to the indoor pool. Um, the indoor pool, it has this centered skyline. So lots of daylight is coming in. It's beautiful during the daytime. But in the evening, we really had to come up with something. And we designed and we designed a pendant luminaire just as part of our um, family of luminaires. And this pendant luminaire, it's actually um, a luminaire made out of bronze again in combination with glass. There are two different sizes. And we mounted those pendant luminaires at two different heights in order to achieve that effect we wanted, this effect of light and shadow on the ceiling and on the walls, which is just, just beautiful. And maybe just as another example, but I'm almost finished. Hello? Hello? Okay, I'm almost finished. Hola? Hola? Hello? Okay. So um, just as another detail, um, just at the far end of the pool, we actually have a little waterfall almost. And we illuminated the waterfall by in-ground linear uplights placed behind the pool, which gives a nice grazing of light to the, the water curtain. Well, I really wanted to show you that project because I said we don't use decorative lighting objects. But, you know, in that case, I mean, there was the necessity to degrade objects. And I think if you create objects, you try to keep it very simple, to, to create a pure and um, simple design. And I think um, the design really feels right to the space and uh, creates this austere lighting, which just feels perfectly, yeah, so the monastic feeling on that side. And that's actually it. Thank you very much. So, I don't know, maybe you have questions, anyone? No? Yes? Oh, come on, guys. <laughs> okay, this... So I hope you're happy, then... Thank you so much, Martina. Um, it's a wonderful presentation where you shared so much information, actually, on all your projects. One question. Um, how do you deal with international projects? Um, I mean, all of these solutions require a lot of um, fine-tuning inside, right? How do you do that when it's a project in Dubai like you do? Sure. I mean, do you hear me? Yeah. So in Spain, it was easy because, I mean, we just could come and uh, we have been here on site very many, many times. And you just come on one day, you stay for a night, and then you leave the other day. And even though it was difficult because, I mean, there are language barriers. Um, the contractor did not speak Spanish, uh, only spoke Spanish, sorry. That time, actually, I learned to speak Spanish because it, there's no other way. And it's OK, but it's, it's great because, I mean, there's this cultural influence and um, you learn so much also with the, with the project in another country. Um, so for projects, for instance, in China, in Shenzhen, or, or in, uh, yeah, in Shanghai, it's completely different. I mean, we have, we have hard times, um, because, especially because of the specifications. I mean, you do specifications, and at the end, the specifications are just changed uh, without you knowing. And then obviously, just with China, there's this huge language barrier. We even have now a Chinese colleague who is doing their whole job, um, talking to the client and um, holding the meetings. So obviously, uh, doing projects in Germany, it's one thing. And we know our culture. We know how we how our brain works and how the client is. but. Being, let's say, with the clients in, in, in China, it's something we have to learn, too. You know, It's not something with years we, we, we understand how, how the client and the architects work in China, or let's say in, in Doha. Um, 
if you take Doha, it's not only culture, it's also the climate. I mean, it's great. We do lots of master plans in, in Doha. And if you think of the stand sandstorms, and if you think of the the yeah the extreme conditions for the luminary, as it's a, it's a, it's a complete different world. And um, yeah, I would say it's learning by doing. Also, you know, once you do a, a do a project in a new country, you you learn with time and um, learn how to understand the culture, which is very important, and learn uh, the differences there. This is what I would say or give as an answer to your question. Yeah. Good. So yeah. I would like to know, like, at what time of the design process do you usually come in? Because as an architect, well, I'm an architect, and I feel like nowadays, like, well, before, like, when you work with, like, when you worked in a project, you always try to have the natural lighting come in. Like, it was something that works seamless with the design process. But I think nowadays it's become, like, in most, like even in the where I work right now, like they use it as an accessory sometimes, and sometimes it's actually very frustrating because you know that that building with the without the appropriate light and without the appropriate like um, uh, experimentation with the space and in it, like it could be more sometimes. Mm -hmm. So I would like to know, like in your office and your experience, like how do you work with the architectural designers, mm -hmm. like? Where, when do you come in, and mm. how do you manage like trying to solve your ideas with the mm -hmm. con original concepts of the of the project? Yeah. Well, to answer the question as soon as possible, <laughs> it's obvious. But uh, we we always, I mean, I have to say, we always enter um, the project in the design phase, in your design phase, the architect's design phase. And obviously, sometimes it's too soon. And then also, we do a couple of loops, which uh, yeah, which uh, which is necessary to develop together a project. But especially because we do lots of daylight projects uh, next to the artificial, we are called very early. And um, you know, it happened even that we changed the complete ceiling because we proposed them to change the skylights and um, yeah, it's, it's give advice. I mean. It's, very often it's only um, a consultancy, you know, to give an advice in a very early stage. Because, I mean, this is a very special thing to deal with daylighting. And, um, yeah, even if you're an architect, this is not your specialty. And it's good to, 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 get, to, to get that advice and to take it on board or not. I mean, but uh, there, there's a lot of, lot of experience. And uh, for the daylighting, I would say we, we came on, come on board very early. But even for the artificial lighting, I mean, if there's anything related to the structure, to the concrete, I mean, you have to come early on board and you can influence together as a team with the architects much, a lot, if you come on board. I mean, it's very frustrating for us as well if they call us late and then, uh, you know, the architect is pissed and the electrical engineer is pissed because they have to change things because we want to change things. So, and this is not good and also then we are also very limited in what we can do. Um, so the best thing is obviously to come in early. And I have to say, um, we are lucky to call in a, well, in most cases, let's say, in a very early stage. Yeah. How long do you during a uh, project like a hotel? How long we do? So we, we started that project in 2007 and finished it last year. So yeah, let me think, uh, eight years? Yeah, it was a long journey, yeah. Wow. yeah. And you use a, a software to calculate the illumination or something? Yes, I mean, it depends on the project. I mean, the hotel project, actually they asked us for calculation, which I thought it was ridiculous. I mean, who cares about lighting levels in a hotel? But we had to, um, to, to, to submit lighting calculations uh, to the authorities. And yes, of course, I mean, we do lighting calculations, but then more, let's say, focused uh, for office building or a museum. I mean, it depends on the project. If it's a lifestyle project, we don't do because it does not make sense.
I'm curious about the uh, lamp you designed for the hotel. Mm -hmm. It was the bronze with the inner golden uh, Which surface. Which the pendant or the wall or in general? No, the, the, the wall mounted. Yeah. Uh, I'm just curious, what color temperature did you use? You know, because golden reflection, it wasn't, it was like the right amount of reflection. I mean, as I saw, it was kind of a neutral color temperature, so you have just a little, a little touch of gold. Mm -hmm. Am I right? I mean, was it on purpose or... I mean, to be honest, for the light color, we used 2,700 Kelvin. We okay. used a warm light color, which I, I, yeah, which combined perfectly. I mean, we did uh, tr uh, tests with the luminary. I mean, the, we had the luminary, we tested different light colors, and it's a LED light inside, and it's, it just feels right with 2,700 okay. Kelvin, yeah. So it, it gave the right, I mean, it gave intensity to the... Definitely, to yeah. The golden yeah. I mean the golden the golden finish it just intensifies it more and uh, it's uh, I would say a reflection uh, material which is very nice for a hotel project and yeah. also for I mean the, the the it's all about the the finishes around I mean the materials um, the architects uses and for that project I would say it's fine maybe for another uh, project yeah. it looks kitsch you know I, yeah. I think for here because the massive also so brutal and have some masculine side on it. We could really use a feminine touch and um, bring in some golden, you know. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. <laughs> All right. So thank you very much for coming. It has been a pleasure. <laughs>